Amen. Well, friends, we are in Jonah today, and we're going to continue our journey in Jonah. We're going to just touch base in chapter 2. We're going to start with one verse in in chapter 1 and then move on to chapter 2. But I encourage you to read Jonah. It's going to take you a long time. It's a whole four chapters, two pages, one page, really, front and back, so you can do it. And uh, remember, if you have the Bible app, uh, version. Uh, you can listen as well as read, so that's a great way to hear God's Word. If you're traveling, you can hook it up on your Bluetooth and play it, and so those are great ways to have God's Word just out into your life, and I encourage you to do that. But let's share God's Word together as is our tradition. We read the Scripture out loud together, so I hope you'll join with us. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, and then on into chapter 2. This is called the Psalm of Jonah, and you'll see that it has a psalm-like quality um, from the, some of the psalms as you read part of it. But let's share together God's word. Now the Lord had arranged a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercy. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. And I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. (laughs) This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Well, a passenger was riding in a cab, and he leaned over and just bumped uh, the, he just tapped the shoulder of the cab driver to ask him a question, and all of a sudden, the the driver just screeched, ah, and he let his hands go of the wheel, and the cab screamed out of control, and he tried to get it back into control, missing a bus, barely, run up on the curb, people running everywhere, and he got it stopped right before they crashed through a plate glass window. (sighs) Oh, The cab driver was so shaken. He goes, I'm so sorry. He goes, are you all right? And the passenger, also shaken, affirmed that, yes, they were all right, but they were also very shaken. And the driver said, I am so sorry, but you scared me to death. And the passenger said, I am so sorry. I had no idea that just tapping you on the shoulder was going to scare you like that. I am so sorry. And the cab driver said, no, I'm the one who's really sorry. He goes, I am so sorry. Today is my first day driving a cab. I just retired from the funeral home and driving the hearst. It's a groaner. I had some groans at first service. But you know, sometimes God asks us to do things that we're familiar with. And like that guy thought he could drive something, but he didn't know the whole story. And sometimes... God asks us to do things that might be unfamiliar or might be uncomfortable to us or might especially bring us to people that we're not real sure about, that we're not real confident about. In fact, we might be sure of the opposite about them. And the Lord invites us to take on things that are uncomfortable to us. So today we're going to continue our journey with Jonah and find out what we need to do to answer God's call. And sometimes when God asks us to do things, that's his call, his ask upon us, to do things that we are hard to do, we all the time God asks us to do things, we should always say, we will with God's help. And that's when, when you're being ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church, you go before the whole conference and the bishop asks you questions and they're written, the answers, of course, are written out. And the answer always is, yes, with God's help. And that's something we should remind ourselves too, that we can do anything with God's help, but are we willing? And are we able to say, yes, I'll do it with God's help? We have the gifts, we have the abilities most of the time, 
And sometimes, like Jonah, it's even our job, but we just don't want to do it. And so how are you answering God's call today? Let's watch this quick video. So what do we know of Jonah so far? If you haven't been here and you haven't been following along with Jonah, this is the first you might have heard from him. Well, Jonah is an effective prophet for the Lord. A prophet is someone who speaks for the Lord on the Lord's behalf, what the Lord tells them to say. A prophet is a person who speaks into the future about what's going to happen. And uh, so Jonah is a prophet, and he's done that job. We know in 2 Kings, we find Jonah mentioned briefly, and he's done his job. So he's only mentioned briefly because he must have done it well. And so today, Jonah is in the past, uh, this, this trip, Jonah has heard from the Lord. And I want you to notice in Jonah how God is presented. We talk about the names of God. And in Jonah, God is presented with capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. And that is Adonai. That is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of the heavenly hosts, the boss, the king of everything, the most powerful being there is. When you see that, you know that this is the God that makes, means business. And so this Lord, the Lord, this this part of God's personality comes to Jonah and tells him to go tell the people of Nineveh that their wickedness has caught God's attention. And if you know anything about wickedness and God, you know you don't want to catch God's attention with your wickedness. And often we fall asleep thinking God's not paying any attention to us. And so God wants Nineveh to know he's going to be paying, he's paying attention to them. And they're not meeting up to his expectation. Now this is an unusual call because Nineveh is a, is a Gentile city. Even though, interestingly enough, Nineveh was founded by Nimrod, who is uh, Noah's great-grandson. So they're people, they're cousins of the Jews, of course, they're related to each other. And yet they're, they're Gentiles, they don't worship the Lord God. And they are also, at that time in Israel's history, their biggest enemy. So you think about our biggest enemies in this world, and and you might agree with the Jews, a Jew of that time. I doubt, well, I don't know, I wonder how you are praying for Putin, right? And Russia, how are you praying for China? How are you praying for Iraq or Iran? How are you praying for those countries and others that, that you might consider enemies of the United States? Well, that's the feeling that the Jews had about Nineveh. They considered them an enemy of the state. And so it's not unusual that the Jews would not want good things to happen to them. But what is unusual is that it doesn't sound like good things are going to happen to them. And that God, though, he wants you to know that that may be your attitude. You may not want good things to happen to them. But God wants all people to repent and come to know him. He wants to bring hope to everyone, and that's a hard part of our God and our faith. Is It's not just for us. He wants everyone to come to know the love he has for us in Jesus Christ. Well, we know Jonah got the message. He's a professional. He's, as my nephew always says, let the professional pray. He's a professional prophet, so he should go and do his job, right? But he doesn't want to. Instead, Nineveh is about 600 miles northwest of Jerusalem where Jonah was when this happened. And Jonah heads out to the east. He goes first to Joppa, which is about 30 miles, to get a boat so he can go to Tarish, which is about 1,000 or 2,000 miles from where he is to the opposite direction, completely opposite direction. And as he gets on the boat, he's made his decision Jonah does something very interesting. He makes himself a comfy bed down in the bottom of the boat, and he falls fast asleep. He has no worries now. He's snoozing. He's disobedient, and he's spiritually asleep. And that's what I want you to think about today. It's possible for you to believe in God, 
It's possible for you to even recite things of God that uh, the confirmation kids are learning the Apostles' Creed. It's, impo- it's possible for you to tell me all sorts of things about your faith and still be spiritually sound asleep. It's very possible for us to n- lose touch with the realities of our faith and not practice our faith. And instead, when God asks us to do something, we just turn a blind eye or don't even hear him. We go in the opposite direction. We're not interested, and we don't even worry about doing it. And that's how we should know we're really asleep. Are you taking God for granted? That's my question for you today. Are you taking God's love and all he does for you for granted? Does God have a call on you to do something that you're just not interested in listening to? Have you fallen asleep in your faith? As Jonah found out, that can be very, very dangerous. And what God will wake you up. He will wake you up, and it may not be very pleasant. We were living in East Peoria when there was a really bad thunderstorm that rolled through, knocked down some branches and stuff. But I'm a hard sleeper, friends. When I sleep... I sl- I'm like Jonah. I can sleep through anything. Jonah was asleep on the boat through a terrible storm that came up. And I, a storm came up at our house. And so my husband, who's not a hard sleeper, got up and went out in the kitchen. And what he noticed when he was in the kitchen, that there was water literally just running like a faucet down the chandelier in the dining room onto our dining room table. And what had happened was we had an antenna, or a, I guess it was a dish, we weren't using it, uh, that was on top of the parsley, which I never paid any attention to, but that storm was bad enough, it broke it loose. And so it had a little hole, and it was raining so hard that the water was running in, tracking down, and pouring all over our dining room table. So I wake up to my husband yelling, Mary Arnold, wake up! Much louder than that. And I was like, what are you yelling? Why are you calling me Mary Arnold? I'm your wife. What is going on here? And he said, I have been yelling at you and trying to wake you up. And I've called at you for three times and you don't hear me. That's how hard I was sleeping. And then when I woke up, I had a mess, mess to help clean up. So it can be a mess when you don't listen and when you sleep hard. And Jonah, as I said, Jonah's asleep on this boat. That sounds all good and fine. But as you read Jonah's story, the Lord sent a terrible storm to come up. Now, these sailors on the boat, they're not, they're not Jews. So they have all their little idols, and they're praying to their idols and asking for help. And the captain goes down and has to wake Jonah up because he's asleep and tell him to pray. Now, friends, when someone has to tell you to pray, there's a problem. You should be praying. In fact, that's the number one thing a person of faith should do. Prayer is our communication with God. If I had to tell you to pray, there's already a problem. And if you have to tell me as the pastor to pray, there's a big problem. So the captain tells Jonah to pray, but does Jonah pray at that time? He does not. It's not recorded that he stops and prays then. No, he tells who he is. I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord God, but I'm not talking to him right now. Are you not talking to God? It can lead to big disasters. And so Jonah says, they, they cast lots because Jonah tells them that, and they're trying to figure out who brought this storm. Something must have caused this storm because it, it just came out of nowhere. And so they cast lots to find out who who caused the storm. The lot falls to Jonah. And they said, what can we do to get this storm to stop? And Jonah says, throw me over the boat. Now, Jonah is with a bunch of, of, you know, Gentiles. They don't believe in God. But, you know, have you ever been around non-church people that are nicer than church people? Yeah, I see you have. Well, so goes it with these sailors. They don't want to throw Jonah over the boat, so they work and try to row to shore. They try to get back so they can do everything they can not to throw Jonah over the boat. Even though Jonah's not praying, Jonah's the cause of the storm, and Jonah worships a God they don't know about, the Lord God Almighty, which terrifies them. 
And so they pray to the Lord, which is an interesting thing about Jonah's stubbornness. He does at least get them to call upon the name of God. They call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to show them mercy and not judge them for, killing, for throwing Jonah over the boat. Because that's they, otherwise they're all going to perish. So they throw Jonah over the boat. And Jonah's sinking in the water, and it seems like this is the end of Jonah's story. He's in this ocean. He hasn't prayed. Even now, he does not call on the Lord to help him. How asleep are you? How asleep is Jonah? And so the sailors then, immediately what happens where they're at? It's calm. But where's Jonah? Sinking in the ocean. But where they're at, it completely becomes calm. And so they sacrifice and and worship the Lord. But Jonah is sinking. And so God is going to wake him up. Now, sometimes we have a little cutie like this to wake us up. Or sometimes your husband is yelling at you in full force voice that you never hear from him because he's very kind and never yells, that to wake up. And sometimes God tries to wake us up. And sometimes it takes more than a gentle nudge to wake us up. So what is going to wake you up today, friends? And when you wake up, you're going to find a different story than when you went to sleep. Jonah woke up inside a whale, or a big fish, as the Bible says. Now, we can argue about the fish. You might say, that's impossible. That doesn't happen. Things don't work that way. But I'll tell you, I found uh, as I was researching that there was in the 18, late 1800s a whaler ship that one of their uh, whalers fell off the boat while they were trying to capture a sperm whale. And of course, they all just thought he was lost. They, bring, they got the sperm whale and they're butchering it and taking it apart. And they finally got to the stomach to find there is their, their sea mate right there in the stomach of the whale. He was unconscious, but he was still alive, and he did recover from that. And so, you know, we can argue about that, but I want to draw your attention that when you start arguing about those kind of details in the Bible, you're sleeping. You're missing the point. You're getting distracted. You're going over here, and you know I tangent all the time, but you're not paying attention to what the point is. Jonah got in this, this whale as the, his dark night of the soul. But as you read Jonah, you'll find out, does he even pray right then? Now, he's, he's been in this whale, so you'd think that's a day. He's been there how many days? Three. And how long does it take to Jonah to start praying to the Lord? Day three. He does not. He is a slow person to wake up. Friends, I would encourage you not to wait so long to talk to God. Now, this passage is wonderful because it reminds us you can pray from God anywhere, even in the stomach of a whale after three days. Whoosh, that would not be a pleasant place. But finally, Jonah decides to pray. Now, don't wait to turn to the Lord for help. Because God is ready and able to help you. 2 Corinthians 6 tells us, on the day I heard you, on the, at the time of salvation, I, rec, I, I delivered you. But it says, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time that I hear you. Now is the day. There is no need to wait. Why wait for awful to come? It's already bad. You don't need to wait for awful to come. But Jonah did. Call on God now. Or better, why wait for any of that to come? Start practicing your prayer life on a regular habit. Humble yourself before God, and he will come to you. That's the Bible's promise. That's God's promise. You don't need to wait till disasters come, but if there are disasters, he will deliver you. Jonah found out that the Lord is his salvation. He, and he would deliver him. He found that out, and, and he hadn't been spit out on the, on the shore, but he decided, yes, I will fulfill my vows to you. Yes, I will profess my faith. I will do what you ask me to do. Even though I'm on the brink of death, I trust that you're going to deliver me, and I will obey you. I have a broken and contrite heart. That's the sacrifice God wants from you. You don't need to sacrifice animals. You don't need to, you can do other things to show that you're sincere. God appreciates that. 
but you need really to show you're sincere in your heart. That's what God really wants to know. How proud and arrogant are you? Are you so proud and arrogant that you think God's not going to do anything about this? I can do whatever I want. No, you can't, friends. Especially not if you claim faith in Jesus. You can't do whatever you want. Where are you in this story so far? Are you sleeping? Are you running? Are you waiting? What's going on with you? Because at the right time, God hears us. And on the day of salvation, he delivers us. But now is the right time. Now is the day of salvation. If you join this church, if you're a member of this church, or any United Methodist church, you make a vow that you are going to support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. You guys will make that vow here in a few, minutes, in a few weeks. Prayer is the number one thing that we are called to do. Are we people of prayer? Are we people who call upon the name of the Lord and trust in the name of the Lord? What stops us? Remember, you don't have to have fancy words to pray. Simply talking to God. I love you, Lord. Help me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Those simple words said sincerely make all the difference. God's joy is to be faithful and loving and kind. That's who our God is. And today is the time that he wants to show you that. So as we prepare ourselves to take communion, I remind you that we practice open communion because this table is the Lord's. Today is the opportunity for you to come to the Lord and to call on him. But let's watch our video one more time as we prepare ourselves to partake of communion. 